All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is going to be Understanding Cloud Services Deployment Models and Licensing Options. Uh, I am Michelle Olson. I'm the Cloud Services Manager for the Socius team here. And I've been with Socius for about a year and a half and very excited to uh, be able to present some uh, additional information to you today. I want to uh, reiterate that you can always reach out to me and ask any questions uh, as a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, don't ever hesitate to ask. You know, call me directly. I'm more than glad to talk about the cloud and make sure that you're comfortable with everything that we're talking about here. Uh, we will have a question section at the end of the call, so feel free to um, you know, ask then, or again, ask in private. If you would like to ask during the time uh, for our call today, you know, feel free to raise your hand, and I have uh, somebody else on the call that will be able to assist us with being able to get your answers right away. All right. For the topic today, uh, we are you know, talking about the different models that there are available in the cloud, making sure you're comfortable with understanding the terminology and uh, giving you a little more education on uh, making some decisions about whether to move to the cloud or not. So we're going to talk about public, private, and a hybrid model of that. And there's also two other public uh, or private models out there called Windows Azure and Microsoft Office 365, and we're going to hit on those. We also are going to talk a little bit about licensing and model, the licensing pricing models that are available. And uh, in conclusion of the call, we will be able to provide you a what's included cheat sheet, and we'll send that to you with the slide deck to be able to um, let you review it uh, after our call. So the big question out there today is to keep on premise or go into the cloud. We hear a lot of our clients asking, and more and more through the years, uh, it's become more prevalent, uh, not with just the, the CIOs or the CFOs about you know, cash flow and business plans, uh, but the end user. They want everything to be able to be easy and readily available to them. And they're used to it in their everyday life at home. You know, say you use uh, online banking, saving your photos to uh, a cloud or your iTunes or things like that. So people are getting more and more comfortable with the whole process and the model that's related to cloud. So why do some people uh, consider the cloud? You know, what are some common factors that uh, send us down that path? Let's say you have a, a limited IT staff. You have a, a small shop. You have a, a guy that's there on certain days. Uh, and you want to be able to uh, expand with those additional services that you can have in your office. Uh, say you want to have a CRM, but you're not familiar with how the process works, but the cost effectiveness of that is, you know, makes it more sense, makes more sense when you want to go online with that CRM offering. Uh, so your staff is not familiar with SQL. Uh, SQL is a license, uh, a database license that some people may not know. Maybe they know Oracle or Linux or things of that nature, and we want to be able to expand again with those services. Maybe it's time to purchase a new server. This is a real common one. Uh, we get common or this question all the time, you know, saying, I'm, I'm looking at buying a new server. Uh, the new software that we are going to implement needs all these additional resources, more RAM, uh, more disk space, and I want to be able to cost compare against the cloud uh, to purchasing a new server. You know, servers typically last about three years, so replacing that server and looking at the cost for being able to have it in the cloud and not worrying about anything else associated, uh, it becomes very appealing for some people. Again, tying that in with the new ERP, uh, the say Dynamics GP 2013, it needs additional resources that a lot of uh, past servers don't have those scalability. So now looking at a new server and adding those additional resources to make that server faster uh, is pretty common. So you're looking at adding in, you know, as we talked about already, the CRM or maybe even e-commerce, uh, some manufacturing, scanning products, 
maybe you're looking at that and you don't have those resources in-house. Uh, this is another typical reason to move to the cloud. So your startup company, uh, you don't have the cash flow or the resources in-house to be able to have your own IT department. So it's very common for people to look at looking um, at in the cloud and making it really easy for them to start up their business and get going. Downsizing as well, where you have a large company that is uh, going to be sold off, maybe only a portion of it is, uh, then you are looking to break off a piece and put part of your business in the cloud or reduce those licenses because you, know, you, you don't want to have all that infrastructure and all those heavy cost licenses sitting on the shelf somewhere. And being able to reduce and expand as needed is very um, appealing. Budget and cash flow uh, is really great uh, concept for the cloud too because you can keep track of that uh, based on the number of users you have and being able to expand and bring it back and knowing where you are going to be if you anticipate growth. Uh, say in six months you want to have 20 users and you're at 15 today. You can budget that in that month that you intend to add those additional users in. Audit concerns, uh, just making sure uh, you have the licensing of the requirements, say if you have HIPAA or um, uh, socks, you know, any of those di different types of compliances that you need. Uh, typically the cloud provider will be able to provide you with a document that uh, satisfies your auditors that are coming in. All right, so let's get to the good. So there's three types of cloud. There's a public cloud, a private cloud, and then the hybrid model. And the hybrid model is most common. So over to the left, I found this picture, and there's a, a brick wall there, and that represents a firewall. And what that is is um, you know, stringent security or networking that is maybe through your business or your private cloud provider. So when you think of these three types, think of the public cloud on the right side where you just log in with a, you know, go to a web address, you type in your username and password, and away you go. A private cloud, there would typically be more, um, maybe a second set of username and passwords. Uh, you're going in through Citrix or a remote desktop. Uh, and it's a little, um, it's, it's just not as easy as going on to a website, put it that way. And the hybrid cloud is a mixture between the two. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So to understand the public cloud, let's think about an apartment complex. This is where you're renting space. You can't paint the walls. Uh, you're going to share laundry facilities. Uh, everybody's got the same carpet. The hallway looks the same. Uh, but it's cost effective. It gets you what you need. And you don't have to think about um, all those other components. You don't have to worry about those expenses that come in with um, you know, replacing a roof or the concrete up to your house. Those types of things, um, you know, a public cloud. CR this would be like CRM online, where you have a URL, you log in, you have your the, um, all of your data, uh, ADP, uh, online banking, where you're just logging in. You can't change how you're viewing your uh, accounts, but yet you can see your transactions. And uh, it's really easy, simple, and away you go. In the public cloud, there's limited customizations, um, limited to no third-party products. A lot of the, the different components out there uh, don't allow you to add on third-party products, you know, like your online banking. You can't you know, add in um, an additional service that goes along with that to be able to get your, your banking out there. Uh, everyone upgrades together. You, know, you typically get an email that says, OK, April 1, we are going to upgrade. And here's the changes that you will see most likely user interface changes, not necessarily functionality to the, the program. Uh, and it, it happens on that Monday morning. You log in, and everything is great. You do have that easy access being able to get from anywhere. Uh, you can use it from a tablet, an iPad, or your phone. You know, if you have, um, you know, for example, an iPhone, you can go to the Safari, type in your banking name, get to the information. Maybe small, but you're still able to get to it and be able to see it. 
the bad thing about it is when your site is down, you know, you are down as well. You don't have anything locally on your PC or your iPad or your Surface to be able to get to that information. Next is the private cloud model. And I think of this as a condo. This is where you own a portion of the uh, infrastructure. Uh, you, you, know, you have your walls. You can change the color. You can change your appliances, uh, change your lighting fixtures, whatever you want to do uh, within your area. You can't go out and change your lawn, per se, or um, you know, change the color of the siding. But you can control uh, what's inside of your home. And uh, you, when you think about this, that's where you have private cloud. There's infrastructure that goes along with the whole uh, uh, behind the scenes that you're sharing with people, but yet you still have the control within your virtual server to be able to make those changes. An example of this would be the Socius Cloud Services. We are a private cloud. So we allow you to be able to bring your third-party products, your ERP, and be able to do what you need to do to make your business uh, more successful. Uh, you you, you kind of get an enterprise level environment that uh, you may not be able to do on premise because you, you don't want to be able to afford that huge infrastructure that goes along with making um, such an elaborate uh, cloud per, um, infrastructure you know, with the SANs and the backup and the monitoring and all that. We, can, we are able to do that in this private, private cloud setting. Uh, Azure does the same thing. It's a, a private cloud model. We're going to talk a little bit more about Azure here in a couple of slides. And then uh, there are some companies, I wanted to bring this up, that when you do research on private cloud, it may reference your own on-premise infrastructure. Because there are some companies, uh, for example, Target, they have their own data center. They have their own uh, infrastructure, SANs, uh, clusters, you know, all that together that make up a private cloud. So you may hear those terms uh, referenced for an on-premise virtual cloud environment. So in the private cloud, you can add or remove resources as needed. We can expand and uh, pull back any of those resources. We make it much easier for management security. And there's less administrative duties, because you don't have to worry about that licensing or tasks at 3 AM, because you do have the extension of that cloud to be able to help you. So the, the key here is customization. Private versus public is the key is the customization that you want to remember when you're thinking about the different models. All right, hybrid cloud. I like to think of it as a cabin where you own your own home, which I'm referencing as on-premise, yet you can go to the cabin. And maybe you're just renting that cabin. So you're going to put it out there, and you can stay as long as you want, as long as you continue to pay. So companies you know, may have their ERP in the, the private cloud, you know, such as Dynamics GP um, hosted with Socius. They may have their email in a private cloud, or excuse me, public cloud, which could be your Office 365. And then maybe you have your file storage on premise, your printers, uh, where you keep all your documents. Um, and maybe even there's a third party that you have on premise yet that may be associated to manufacturing or something like that. But a hybrid model is the most common. This is where uh, companies are debating on you know, getting rid of new hardware, deciding what they need, need to do with that upgrade. Um, there may be multiple vendors involved, but some providers out there, such as Socius, can uh, work with you to be able to be responsible uh, for those relationships where you can say, well, I want you to manage the Office 365. I want man you to manage uh, this relationship with the binary stream. However it works, um, the hybrid model, again, is most popular. Um, you are able to use the resources that are available out there for the cloud in a private or public, yet be able to have your own uh, infrastructure still back at home with the, the file storage and you know, do the things that you need to do there. When you do go full cloud, this, your file storage and uh, your networking and things like that actually become what we call virtual desktop. So we'll move everything up to the cloud, and then your cloud provider becomes an extension of your company 
and we um, you know make sure that everything works appropriately for you. All right, Windows Azure. It, several months ago, I was out online and reading about Azure, and it seemed to me that the marketing represented that you could get Dynamics GP or NAV uh, just by logging into a site, and away you go. But that is not the case. What Windows Azure is, um, is I like to think of a hotel. There are lots of amenities that you get with um, this world, and you're able to stay as long as you want. But once you leave, you get to bring your stuff with you. you uh, what the Azure is, is a, it's a platform where you log in. You can define exactly what you want for your resources, say, um, you know, a terminal server where you're going to put in your application, uh, a SQL server to be able to have your database. You assign that. But you have to still have that knowledge to be able to know what you're looking for or rely on a partner to be able to assist you with this. An example of what uh, Windows Azure is today would be uh, Amazon Web Services. That's a little more popular today, uh, although Windows Azure is um, you know, coming in pretty strong uh, with the development world. But I just wanted to be able to provide you of what a true uh, Azure is a comparable to as it would be Amazon Web Services. It's also known as a, a platform as a service, which would be PAAS. Um, we're going to talk about two of those other acronyms here in a second, um, but it's you know it's very easy to set up the servers uh, because you actually and you go to the next screen here. When you go out to Azure, you say okay, do you want small, medium, large, and you click on it, and it provides the information that goes along with that server and the actual cost over to the right on being able to understand how much it's going to cost you per month. I struggle with Azure right now because the cost does fluctuate. I think the joy of the cloud, as we've talked about already, is being able to identify and budget for cash flow, being able to add and remove users when you need to, uh, expand resources uh, that is pretty much a part of that same user call. Public and private clouds are really identified by the user. When you get to Windows Azure, it's all related to the server itself. You, um, you can bring your own licensing. You can buy your own licensing. You can add resources. You can, not, um, you can not back up. You can add antivirus. So it's kind of all over the board to today in my eyes. It's not uh, your typical software as a service. It is a, or even infrastructure as a service for that matter. I think it's really just uh, a way for you to be able to get in and um, create those servers that you don't want to purchase outright. New with licensing this year is the ability to take uh, Microsoft ERP licensing and put it into Azure as a leased option. So again, just this year, Microsoft announced this, where you can take the Dynamics GP license and you can lease that on a monthly basis and put into Azure or even your on-premise model. Uh, again, when you turn off service, you no longer have this license. So it can be um, pretty interesting for a business that's up and running. Uh, but you can uh, replace that license on-premise if you decided to or if you go to another provider and um, you know, pick back up where you were. But you just have to purchase that license or find a new source to get that license. I wanted to... Uh, I put in a link up here so you can get to Azure, but also noting the free trial. If you're ever interested in uh, jumping out here to see what Azure is, you can set up a couple servers just to see how smoothly the process goes for setting up a server. And um, I think they give you a $200 credit. And depending upon how much work you actually do on the server, you know, it can last from three days to um, two weeks. Um, I don't think it would be more than that. Um, but you, again, you can try it out. Uh, it is free, uh, and they won't fill your card you know, once you turn off those services. So next is Office 365, and I think Office 365 is a great product. Socius actually uses it uh, internally ourselves for all of our users. 
and uh, I've been in the cloud world for about 14 years now, and one of the biggest um, um, well, competition, not competition, um, one of the biggest headaches, put it that way, was Exchange. It became mission critical. It's a mission critical application for your employees. And when something happens where you can't get out a report or the work that you need to do at 11 o'clock at night, you had to be able to be up and getting that working for your end users, whether it be in-house or your, your cloud model. So Office 365 has really uh, done away with that in providing support because now somebody else is responsible for it. Uh, they, the redundancy that's built in with the Office 365 is great. You, uh, if you don't have internet access, you're still able to get to your email through the rich clients that you are typically uh, able to use uh, just on your laptop or your uh, Surface, your iPad, your phone, however. Um, we've been using it for some time now, and I, I just find it just awesome product. And anybody should be looking at it, if, rather than having those exchange boxes, all the licensing that goes with it. Uh, and there are different models that you can purchase. I'm going to bump over to a next slide here. You'll see the different models, where it goes from $5 up to $22. And down here is where it actually notes whether you get the applications on your desktop. So when you download, you'll be able to have Word and Excel and PowerPoint. My son actually uses this um, on his own laptop, and he just downloads, has it all available to them or to him, and he's able to log on from school to be able to get to whatever he needs as well because he has the online account. With Office 365, you have the option for the SharePoint and Link. And our business uses Link every day. Uh, it's an awesome tool. You are able to get to um, uh, instant messaging, but you also have the video chat. You can share information. You can swap files. Uh, it's just a it's a priceless tool for any business, uh, big or small. And you can also utilize Link with other companies who are using Link. So we have Microsoft people when we do our calls, they pop on Link as a you know method for doing our meetings, and it's just really great. So out here, uh, uh, this link is provided here, officeandmicrosoft.com. You can see the different models. And as you scroll down, there's going to be a checklist of does it include this, does it include that, how do I uh, match to my domain, uh, lots of great information on the different price models. And you'll see there's an annual option um, and as well as a monthly option. And depending upon your company, if you do have um, maybe if you're a not-for-profit, uh, you can get different pricing available for you. So work with your associate's partner or account manager to be able to uh, you know, help you weed through that to be able to get that good pricing. Over here to the left is where you'll see there's education plans, government plans, not-for-profit plans. The last thing that I want to talk about is the licensing model. So as we talked about already, there's the private, the public, and the hybrid model. And within those models, you have um, these two different choices here. There's infrastructure as a service, it's where you bring your own licensing, also referred to as hosting. You can purchase the ERP software. As and a provider provides the licensing, but you also have to stay up on that maintenance. So keep that in mind when you're using infrastructure as a service, so say a private cloud or a hybrid model, you still have to keep up on the maintenance. When you move to a software as a service model, which would be more of your, uh, your public licensing, uh, you lease all that software. So you log into uh, CRM online. You don't have to worry about additional maintenance. You don't have to worry about buying any licensing. You just log on, and away you go. Uh, very common to have the user-based pricing. And then when you do decide to move on-premise, you just got to uh, think about whether you are going to purchase that software or if you're going to move that lease to a different provider. Because software as a service is, you know, you can have it as long as you want to use it, and then it goes away at the end of that term. So much like that hotel, it's, uh, you check into the hotel, when you check out, you're done paying, 
you know, everything you know, pretty much goes away. All right, I think we have a, a, about five minutes left here uh, to be able to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, we will be providing the slide deck back to you and a checklist, if you, um, a cheat sheet to be able to um, you know, compare the different models for your business on what's included and what's not. I don't currently see any questions, um, but please do raise your hand if you do have any questions. I'll be more than glad to talk through uh, any of this information with you. And if you're not ready to do that today, you know, feel free to reach out. I will gladly set up a private conversation with you. Uh, no, no obligation to anything on our side of the world, just wanting to make sure that we are looked at as your trusted advisor and we can talk through any of the options that you're thinking about for the cloud. More than glad to help you. Also at uh, cloudtechnology.com, which is our, um, it's a link from our associates site anyway, um, you will be able to see our pricing model and you will see uh, the different methods that we just talked about. You're going to see infrastructure as a service, the software as a service, and the price that's associated with that. So it'll give you a rough idea of what you're looking at for pricing. But I can tell you the infrastructure as a service runs about $165 a user, and that's with you providing the license. And we provide all the infrastructure, the disaster recovery, the backup, you know, everything that goes along with the, the infrastructure through a private cloud model. Software as a service is, uh, depending upon what level you're looking at, uh, can be 230 or 240 of user. And again, it does include all of the items that would be included in the infrastructure too, all the way down to disaster recovery and redundancy. All right, I don't see any other questions. We do have a couple of questions here, Michelle. I can field okay. them to you. Um, if you move to the cloud and upgrade from NAV 2009 R2 to NAV 2013 R2, do you have the same software development costs? That's a good question. Um, that's where we would have an, a consultant step in to work with us on what that customizations would be. Uh, my team as the cloud would provide you that infrastructure, making sure it meets the requirements uh, to make sure it works fast for you and the speed and things like that. But a consultant may be needed to be able to talk about what those services are required from going from 09 to the 2012. And, uh, Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind, we can flag that. We can have somebody reach out to that person um, or maybe just send an email back to answer the question. Sure. And then the follow-up question is, is the 165 per user per month or year on the license? Uh, the 165 is per user per month. And... Uh, the licensing you would have to purchase if you went that model. So you'd purchase that and you would have to pay that licensing maintenance. And I believe the licensing maintenance is annual, so you have to pay that on a yearly basis. Okay. Looks like that's all the questions. Oh. Yep, looks like that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. All right. Just to remind you, love talking about the cloud. So feel free to call me. I can email any questions. Um, more than glad to talk through making sure you're comfortable with anything related to the cloud. Uh, it is, um, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. I do, I realize that, that you can educate ourselves today. But staying up on that uh, is uh, really crucial. Uh, Azure causes some confusion. And if you just want to ask about that, I'd be more than glad to talk to you too. So I'm here for you.